In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We offer our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant, and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave from there. Somehow in this novena, I've managed so far to align the ten principal virtues of the Blessed Virgin Mary with the readings of the day. And largely that's because the virtues of Our Lady are not esoteric or strange. They are the heart of what we've been called to by the gospel. And they're the perfection of the human nature that we all share and that we share with her. The success or failure of at least one of these virtues is bound to be reflected in every story we tell that takes seriously our struggle to live the moral life. Today, though, I'm going to have to cheat a little bit. St. Mark often tries to keep the action moving in his gospel and sometimes gives us stories that are very quick and to the point. But there's a very important element of this sending of the twelve that we find in Matthew and Luke that can help us reflect on today's virtue. Our Lord tells his disciples, into whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this household. If a peaceful person lives there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Even as our Lord sends out the twelve to preach repentance and to drive out many demons and anoint with oil many who were sick and cure them, He also sends them to be ministers of peace. Peace is not something we can truly bring or give unless it really is present in our hearts. And if we want to convey that peace the way Mary does, we will need to imitate her angelic sweetness. Now, sweetness is often something we attribute to children. Children in their innocence, in their wonder, in their simple joy in the world, gives us a sense of delight and joy and peace. We're drawn to them, and by that sweetness, 
drawn to love them. And we've hopefully all encountered people who, in adulthood, still carry and convey something of that same sweetness. Mary, in her perfect innocence, in her ardent charity and love for her children as mother of the church, is a perfect model of that sweetness. That friendliness and affability that draws us to her, draws us to her apparitions and her shrines and her feasts, and fills us with that delight and joy and peace. We are called to be that for others as well. To be ministers of joy and peace in a world that is not innocent and often filled with cruelty and plagued by all kinds of division. But one of the things that often gets in the way of that is our anger. How many of us in rush hour traffic would have our demeanor described as angelic sweetness? Anger is what we feel when we perceive that there is an injustice. Not a bad thing in itself, but more often than not, in our fallen condition, it can really get distorted. Sometimes our anger is disordered because there isn't really an injustice present. It just feels like there is. Usually because you've somehow pricked my pride, perhaps taking away my sense of control, or just not giving me what I want. Sometimes our anger is disordered because it's not proportionate. And we feel tremendous anger at something that's really very small. But even when there is an injustice, and our anger is a proportionate response, that is, we really have a righteous anger, it is still never okay to allow anger to make our decisions for us. We need to acknowledge our anger and then set it aside and do the good that we need to do. And our Lord, of course, is the perfect example of this. Sometimes the good we need to do means turning over tables and driving the money changers out with whips. Our Lord does that not because he's angry, but because it needs to be done. The disciples are told to shake the dust off their feet in testimony against those who refuse to receive them, not out of anger, but in the hope of conversion. And even Our Lady, in her angelic sweetness, still crushes the serpent's head. But sometimes the good we need to do means taking up our cross and going to our own crucifixion. Sometimes it means just turning the other cheek. Perhaps it means standing at the foot of the cross and being present for someone else who is being crucified. Unfortunately, we often don't set aside our anger. Sometimes it's because we can't. It's hard, and we don't yet have that level of self-mastery. Often we need to separate ourselves from the situation until we can gain that mastery and instead be concerned with the good of those involved so that we never act out of our anger but rather 
out of charity. Sometimes the problem, though, is that I actually like to be angry. I love getting fired up about everything that's wrong with my in-laws, everything that's wrong at work, everything that's wrong with the state, the nation, the world, the church, because I'm right and they're wrong and I love feeling righteous. But that anger in our hearts can never lead to peace. And it will always foul up any attempt to seek justice. The solution is the virtue of meekness. Meekness is not a weakness. Meekness is a tremendous strength that allows us to do the good we need to do even in the face of injustice. To put the anger aside and do the work of the Lord. To seek to take those stands that we need to take in our society, but not out of anger, rather out of reason and reflection and prayer. Out of a desire for the good and a love for our neighbor. It is only with that meekness when the anger no longer makes the decisions that we can imitate an angelic sweetness. That we too can be ministers of peace and bring delight and joy and comfort to those who need it. As we draw them ultimately not to ourselves, but to the Lord. We celebrate every day the gravest injustice in all of history in the crucifixion of our Savior and our God. And yet we remember not in anger, but in the joy of our salvation. As we receive Jesus Christ, the bread from heaven, having within it all sweetness. As the angelic sweetness of Mary was a profound comfort to our Lord on the cross, so may we too have that virtue to be ministers of peace and joy to all of his brethren. That in this world of injustice and suffering, all might be drawn to and comforted by his inexhaustible love. And so let us conclude our prayers with our novena prayer to Our Lady. O Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, You are the refuge of sinners, the health of the sick, and the comfort of the afflicted. You know my wants, my troubles, and my sufferings. By Your appearance at the Grotto of Lourdes, You made it a privileged sanctuary where Your favors are given to people streaming to it from the whole world. Over the years, countless sufferers have obtained the cure for their infirmities, whether of soul, mind, or body. Therefore, I come to you with St. Jude as my patron to implore your motherly intercession. Obtain, O loving mother, the grant of my requests. Through gratitude for your favors, I will endeavor to imitate your virtues that I may one day share in your glory. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit.